We're in the Gospel of John. All these passages tie together really in important ways. We're at the very beginning of John, though, this morning. And I'll read several verses, but I only really want you to pay attention to the last one. So John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43, reading through the end of that chapter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly, I tell you, amen, amen, he said. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll be telling some old stories today, and some of them are more familiar, some less perhaps. Uh, And important things are going on, and I don't want you to miss them. I have no time for those who say the Bible is full of secret codes, and if you can figure out exactly what uh, word order or what numbers might correlate to what letters, and if you can get the right sequence right, then you will find some hidden code in the Bible that was popular back in the 90s for a while. It will be again, I'm very sorry to tell you, it is not the way that God works in His Word and in this world. God is not at all interested in some sort of secret code that some get and others don't. God's invitation goes out to the whole world, and God reveals himself in Scripture so that we know who he is and who we are as the people of God. That being said, when Jesus said, you will see angels ascending and descending on, every single person within reach of his voice knew exactly what he was referring to, first of all, and then they had to think to themselves, what on earth is he talking about? They knew exactly the story he was talking about, but then were really wondering what he could possibly have meant by that. The story, of course, is the story of Jacob's ladder. Our version had stairway. Uh, The old translation of this Bible had stairway and ladder as uh, uh, alternate translations. And in order to understand that story, we're going to have to go back even farther. Because when Jacob has this dream, and it's an extraordinary dream, he sees this stairway or this ladder that starts on earth and the top reaches up to heaven. And it's a highway for angels. It's this thoroughfare. It's like this heavenly escalator. Angels are going up and coming down. Ascending and descending, same word order that Jesus uses. You will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which is a strange image. Jacob's ladder, a familiar image. But even when Jacob had this dream, God was doing something huge. I'm going to take you back to one of the oldest stories of all then. Back to the story of the Tower of Babel. We read this story and we hear about these people who had these great ambitions and they seem slightly sacrilegious, maybe blasphemous, a hair. Uh, but basically they wanted to build this tower that reached all the way up to heaven. And then it looks as if God got mad at them and decided, I'm not going to let you do that. And if you read this story of the Tower of Babel that way, then you're, you're missing entirely what was going on there. In the ancient world, particularly in ancient Mesopotamia, so modern-day Iraq, uh, there were all of these temples, and they're called ziggurats. And these temples always had stairways around the outside, and usually several of them. And the temples were built uh, in steps, and they would go up. They're kind of like pyramids, but don't picture the Egyptian pyramids with the smooth sides. These are stepped or stared pyramids, which, interestingly enough, About 3,000 years or so later, uh, the Mayans and others were building in Central America. I've gotten to climb one of them in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. The steps are really high. Like, it's not like a regular stair step all the way up to the top. It's about a double or triple step. And so you're really tired by the time you get to the top of this stone pyramid that steps down all the way, all the way down. Uh, It's easier to build that way than to build the smooth-sided pyramids of the Egyptians. 
but both with the Mayans and Incas as well, as certainly with the ancient Mesopotamians, the uh, Sumerians and the Babylonians, uh, all those speaking Akkadian, uh, those peoples, there was a reason. A, it's easier, of course, but also they had a very much in mind a stairway image. The stairs were supposed to take you up to heaven. And there are several ziggurats that have been restored, found and restored in modern day Iraq, and they had important names. This all has to do with Babel, and then it has to do with Jacob, and then it's going to get to Jesus and what it has has to do with us today. In the town of Larsa, there's a ziggurat, this step temple stairway going all the way up, all the way up. Sometimes these would be eight levels high. And it was called the house of the link between heaven and earth. In the ancient world, 2,000 years or so before Jesus showed up, it's a big deal to build an eight-story temple, this huge structure. Biggest thing in the city, for sure. You can see it from miles around. And if you haven't had skyscrapers and other big buildings in your imagination, these are immense. They do seem to reach to heaven. In Babylon itself, uh, the temple, the ziggurat, was called something like uh, the building whose top is in heaven. That should sound familiar from our story. Or the house of the foundation platform. I'm not sure exactly what that means, the foundation platform. Of heaven and earth. They were specifically trying to join heaven and earth. That's the real problem with the Tower of Babel. And that's the real problem with all the temples that Jacob may have seen that looked like this, this stairway that reached up to heaven. The Tower of Babel was not people getting a little too big for their britches, as I was told when I was growing up. Not people getting a little too ambitious and maybe just a little bit prideful. They were trying to build a temple that would reach up to heaven so they could storm the gates of heaven they wanted to take over, which is our first and worst sin always. God is God and we are not, and somewhere in our heart of hearts we want to be God. And the real problem with the Tower of Babel was not that they were overly ambitious or prideful. The real problem was it was outright rebellion. If we can just build it high enough, we can get to heaven. When we get there, who knows? We might be able to take the whole place over and then we can run things. That's an old, old, old story, Tower of Babel. But in this very region where Jacob was, in the very region where Babylon eventually was founded, there were these temples and there were stairways up the temples. And the idea was you get closer to the gods that way. Along the way, of course, after Babel, I realized maybe we shouldn't try to get there so we can bring God down, but maybe we can get up a little closer to God. And if we could just build it high enough and climb high enough, we can be closer to God. That's why Jacob's dream was so strange. He sees a stairway. It's almost certainly the most enormous ziggurat that he could ever imagine. This huge temple with these stairways. And the stairway does go all the way up to heaven. He says that he sees the bottom is resting on the earth and the top reaches up to heaven. And then there are angels going up and coming down. And I'm not sure why. It's a really vivid, evocative image. Angels coming and going from heaven to earth. What are they doing? Angels are fascinating to us. It was also a big uh, fad uh, to, to be interested in angels and writing about angels. And in the end, they're too mysterious for us to know very much about. But clearly, they had work to do on earth, earth and work to do in heaven. And they are making their way going back up to heaven and coming down to earth. Jacob sees it. He doesn't even have to see a vision of the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the messengers of God, the angels. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. Jacob's ladder from then on. And Jacob's ladder has been an evocative image all the way down for thousands of years now. There, uh, there's a plant in the northeastern U.S. named Jacob's ladder. There, of course, have been songs like the one that I sing. Stairway to heaven doesn't really reference the Bible much, but it's the same idea, the stairway that somehow goes uh, up to heaven. Uh, there's been a horror film called Jacob's Ladder. That worries me a bit. A folk toy you may have seen, the one that flip-flops, the little blocks that are connected by cloth, and they flip-flop all the way down. Uh, electricians, engineers may know about the climbing arc of voltage that, that builds up and then peters out and starts up again called a Jacob's Ladder. For about two minutes this morning, I, f- I found out and then I thought, oh, I might do this for the children's lesson as well. Um, if you're one of those kids who used to play with string and made cat's cradles and other things, there's also a Jacob's Ladder, which you can learn to do in 15 easy steps. And after step three, I thought, okay, I'm just going to talk about the fact that you can do it. I am not. And I'm not going to do that. It's challenging enough for me to put the fish together for one great hour sharing. I am not going to embarrass myself tying my hands up with string in front of you. 
It's a 1946 movie also, uh, Stairway to Heaven, which was an interesting romantic uh, movie as well. Vivid image, it grabs our imagination. This idea that there is this connection between heaven and earth and angels are going up and coming down and God is in this place. The Celtic peoples would talk about uh, places on earth, they said, were, were thin places, where the distinction, the boundary between this world and the other world, however they would define that for us, this world and the next, this world and heaven perhaps, was thin. And they had a feeling that this was one of those places where you could almost break through into a holy spiritual realm or maybe into heaven or maybe into some other world. Evocative image. That somehow there is a place if you could just get there and you just were almost there and you could just climb right up to heaven with the angels. We are climbing higher, higher. We are climbing higher, higher. The last verse of Jacob's ladder. Big things happen when Jacob had this dream. He's fleeing, by the way. He's tricked his father. He's made his brother so mad his brother wants to kill him. Uh, He is on his way, fleeing for his life. Jacob, of course, is the hero of the story, but you should know that like most of the heroes in the Bible, he is flawed. Uh, He is deceitful. He's a liar. Uh, He went after something that was not his and got it. And then when he was found out, he made a run for it. This flawed, deceitful, jokester, mischievous man goes to sleep and finds that he is in a holy place, the house of the Lord, Beth El, God was in this place and I did not know it. And in the dream, all the promises that God made to Abraham and the promises that went down to Jacob's father Isaac are now conferred upon him. I will give you descendants. That was a big thing for Abraham. He had no children. He was an old man. I will give you the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And it's a bigger family by now, but nothing compared to what it's going to be. Jacob's going to have a dozen or so sons. You will spread out in all directions, north and south and east and west. And then the most important promise made to Abraham, whether he realized it or not, he may have taken it only as a compliment. All nations, all peoples will be blessed through you and through your offspring, which ties Jacob not only to his grandfather Abraham, but ties us to that promise. Because that promise was seen really early on by the church as clearly pointing to Jesus, the one who is the offspring of Abraham, who will bless all nations, all peoples. The story in John is is great. It's powerful and it's short. You want more of the story, but you can tell by people's reactions exactly what's going on. Jesus, this teacher, this rabbi, is able to see things that other people can't see. And he's able to see beyond sight and farther than he ought to be able to. That's why Nathaniel, who comes as the real skeptic, we talk about Thomas as doubting Thomas. Nathaniel came in pretty much doubting. Can anything good come from Galilee, from Nazareth in Galilee? I doubt it. Uh, It's a tiny little town and it's in the wrong part of our country and nobody good lives there comes from there and within a few minutes he is saying you are the son of god this faithful israelite this faithful jew you are the king of israel jesus said that's great you're on the right track and you believe and you've seen some things but you will see greater things than these i was going to tell you at the beginning why i didn't want you to miss out on things i told you about the bible code Don't spend your time on it. Waste of energy. Uh, But the other thing is, in the Bible, sometimes there are these comments that seem throwaway comments to us and yet are hugely important. Now, I have realized over the years that just because I think something is really exciting and interesting does not mean that it will be so to you. And I have a very good friend who now lives in Scotland, and he could do something as simple as um, say, oh, now I'm looking for my reference here. Um, Oh, that's right. It goes back to Genesis. He could do something as simple as this. Jacob said, this is the gate of heaven. And we would start talking about all the gates in the Bible. Where are important gates? Who said the important things about gates? And we think that's fascinating. And i got to figure out a way to make that fascinating for you. Jesus says, you're going to see angels ascending and descending. And that is a comment that rings out. Everybody would know that. Just like once upon a time, everybody knew what remember the Alamo meant. Just about once upon a time, everybody knew about the day that would live in infamy. Sorry, those are both war images. I couldn't come up with any others that would really ring out that way. But people had an immediate reference. 
And I may have to give my kids those references over lunch. But at once upon a time, people knew exactly what you were talking about. If you, that, you Just that throwaway comment, and a lot was loaded into it. When Jesus says you'll see angels ascending and descending, they know that he is talking about the promises of God to his people that have gone on generation after generation and through ups and some serious downs, the people thrown into exile and finally coming back and trying to rebuild their temple. And the whole history of salvation of God's people rests on that strange dream where angels are going up and coming down. And Jacob says, this is where the Lord is. And I did not know it. And God reiterates, he repeats his promises. I will be with you till I have done all of these things, until I give you your descendants, until they spread out everywhere, and until all nations are blessed through the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're going to see heaven open up, and angels are going to be ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In John's Gospel, this is the first time we really hear him talking about himself in this way. This is Jesus' designation for himself. When he talks about himself, he uses the third person not as the sort of royal we or uh, any other sort of strange way how some celebrities and athletes refer to themselves uh, as if they were not themselves in the third person. He doesn't mean that. He's loading a lot into Son of Man. You'll see angels ascending and descending on me. Now, that's a weird image. Because if you think of angels as these uh, great, glorious, powerful creatures that make shepherds and others fall down on their faces in fear, then it's this is a sort of different image. All of a sudden, you've got these tiny little angels, and that can't possibly be right. What is Jesus talking about? He wants them to remember this old, old story where once upon a time, one of the patriarchs, one of the founders of their faith as well as of their line, saw angels going up and down at a place where heaven and earth met. And in a way that did away with all the idolatry of the other ziggurats, these other step temples, as a way, if we can only get close to God, then maybe God will pay attention to us. What Jacob saw was that God was already paying attention. There was already a connection and angels were coming back up to heaven, even as they were coming back down. You don't have to get a little higher and maybe God can hear you. You don't have to talk a little louder and maybe God will pay attention to you. You don't have to repeat God's name over and over and over again, hoping that somehow you can catch his attention among all the other important things that he is doing. Jesus makes reference to this instance when God is near. God is there. I did not know it, but God was in this place. And now Jesus is saying that stairway, that connection, that place where heaven meets earth is going to be in me. And that's crazy. And that changes everything. Jesus, the one in whom heaven and earth meet. Jesus, the highway to heaven and the route by which angels ascend and descend from heaven to earth. Jacob says, this is the gate of heaven. Jesus goes on. He says, you're going to see greater thing than these. Uh, In chapter 10, he's going to talk about sheep and shepherds and flocks and all of that. And they would know about sheep and shepherds and flocks. And he's going to talk about being the gate of the pen. Well, that's, of course, how you keep the sheep safe. You have a stone wall around the sheep and you have a gate. And that's going to keep them from getting out uh, when they aren't protected. And it's going to keep things from getting in and people from getting in and stealing them if the gate is protected. And having fixed that image in their mind so they know exactly what he's talking about, then he just says... I am the gate, not the gate for the sheep, not the gate of the pasture, not the gate of the sheepfold. I am the gate. Jacob said, this is the gate of heaven. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Huge declaration about who he is and what he is up to. And a little bit later, of course, he will say, not only is he the gate, he is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. Here's the weird thing about the Gospel of John. Different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke in some ways, and this is one of the important ones. Very truly, amen, amen, I say to you, you will see heaven open up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You think, when did that happen? When he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he is glorified and they see that this rabbi, this teacher of theirs, who was really interesting and had a lot of power and did some really amazing things, But then they see him in his glory and they realize this is the immortal, beloved son of God. That's pretty glorifying. That's a pretty glorious sight. And that's not what he means at all. Maybe he means Easter morning. The stone is rolled away and suddenly the tomb is empty and Jesus appears. And this is an amazing thing. And that's not what he means either. 
Maybe at his ascension, Jesus is is raised up again to heaven from whence he came, and all the disciples stand there looking up into the sky, and more angels are there saying, what are you doing looking up there? He's going to come back just the way you saw him go. And that's not what John means at all. This is the strange thing about John. The way that John presents the good news of Jesus Christ is this. God and Jesus, and God in Jesus, is most glorified in the crucifixion. It's not the end of the story by any means. And all of our salvation comes because of the resurrection, but it has to begin in the crucifixion. This is the strange thing. When Jesus says, you're going to see heaven open up and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, that is when the gate of heaven is open and Jesus says, I am the gate itself and anyone who enters through me will be saved. And that happens on the cross. This is a crucifixion image that Jesus is giving us here in the Gospel of John. He is most glorified and most glorifies God in his suffering and in his passion. This is when the gate is opened up. It's a great Scottish commentator on John, a whole lot of the other Old Testament. A friend of mine got to study under this man, F.F. Bruce. He said, what Jesus is talking about there here is his crucifixion. But here's the thing. By the cross, heaven is thrown wide open. All those old temples were an attempt to get close enough to God that we could have some influence, get close enough to God that we could get his attention, get close enough to God that we can convince God to do what we want God to do. The dream that Jacob had turns it upside down and says, God is already here and already near and already involved. And Jesus' statement that you'll see angels of God ascending and descending on me means that God draws near to us. And we are reconciled to God through that. Well, it's a story about archaeology and it's a story about history, but it's really a story about stories. Going back to the Tower of Babel, when people thought they could displace God, they could uh, bring together some sort of coup and bring God down from heaven. And then all that time since then when people were trying to build things up for various gods, God of the moon, God of the sun, other gods, and if only we could get close enough, then maybe we can't be God, but maybe we can get God to do things our way. And then Jacob has this dream that shows that there are thin places in this world. There are places where heaven and earth are connected. The Lord was here, and I did not know it. And Jesus shows up and says, the Lord is here, and I want you to know it. Not a code, not a puzzle, not inside knowledge, but clear as can be. Every single one of those disciples and people gathered around knew what he meant. You'll see angels ascending and descending. He's talking about Jacob. He's talking about the promises of God. And now he is claiming those promises for himself and through himself to all people. All nations will be blessed through you. I am the gate. I am the stairway. I am the ladder. We're climbing Jacob's ladder by the grace of God. Jesus comes and is the bridge, is the stairway, is the ladder. He is the one in whom heaven and earth meet so that the gates of heaven can be thrown wide open for you and for me. God has already drawn near to us in Christ and he calls us to be his own people. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, by the way that we live and love, by the way that we worship and serve, help us to show that we are indeed your people. Help us to be bold over that you would throw wide the gates of heaven that we might come in. That you who are far beyond our reach would come near to us in Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Heaven came down so that we could come up, so that we could not only be your people, but as Jesus promised his disciples, according to his desire, that we could be with you where you are. Help us to live as those who are climbing the ladder, uh, whose feet are on the steps, who are